Oh, hello, come in, come in, come in again. Hi, oh, great, good, good, glad you're back. Do you know, it was some... Um, it was such fun last time just getting getting out a couple of Tennysons and thinking about them. It's really put me in a Tennyson mood and I thought we might just have a, indulge ourselves in a bit more Tennyson and maybe even read a bit more of, of The Lady of Shalott since, um, since we didn't get very far with it. So I've got a few things down here. You Last time I showed you this one, the very luxurious one with the William Holman Hunt and Everett Millet and um, uh, down to Gabriel Rossetti illustrations and I think this one. Um, so uh, I've got, <laughs> got shelves and shelves of Tennyson. This is quite fun. Um, Andrew Wheatcroft, a biography uh, uh, in original photographs with an introduction by Sir John Betjeman, the Tennyson album. And there's the great poet and his wife Emily and his two sons in their garden. And of course, Tennyson is, you know, a great figure of the 19th century, but lives long enough into it to be there for the for the age of photography and was of course a friend and neighbour of Julia Margaret Cameron, the the great um, the great pioneer of photography. I rather like this later Tennyson. I like his kind of slightly wild and craggy and dishevelled look, even though Emily, his wife there, is clearly doing her best to try and make him look a little bit tidy, but it it doesn't always come off. Uh, and um, so this has wonderful, look, there is Tennyson's writing hut. I have a little writing hut, and Tennyson made his own little writing hut at the bottom of the garden. Um, there he is meeting the great Italian hero, Gary Baldi. So there's lots to admire here, another fine portrait. Um, but um, let me turn on, uh, there's, a, there's a, a, a drawing here. Since I've been inviting you into my study and... This is a sort of, I mean, he's got a rather bigger study than I have, and um, uh, but he's got the lovely dogs as well, just like I have. So, as you can see, I do identify with Tennyson in various ways, and uh, perhaps my favourite portrait is that one. I love this, uh, that's Tennyson, quite toward, you know, older Tennyson, his beard going grey a little bit in his pocket watch. And I love this broad-brimmed dark hat. Apparently those hats were called a wide-awake hat. And there's a kind of gloomy magnificence about Tennyson. I think it was Carlyle who said of Tennyson that he's always carrying a bit of chaos around inside himself, which he manufactured into cosmos in his poetry. So that's fun. But I also got this out. This is just gorgeous. It's called The Gateway to Tennyson. That's beautiful, beautiful cover. This was the when they really did things magnificently. And it's an introduction by Andrew Lang, whom you may remember collects all those fairy stories, um, you know, the, the yellow fairy book. And, and in fact, this is a book for children introducing lovely, introducing children to Tennyson and particularly to the Tennyson Arthurian poems. So there's a lovely illustration of the marriage of Arthur and Guinevere. Tales and extracts from the poet's works with an introduction. It's in fact by Mrs. Andrew Lang. Um, and um, it's got some prose retellings, but it, it, um, it's also got a rather lovely little children's life of Tennyson with illustrations of the rectory at Summersbury where he was born and um, various other literary characters. There's Byron. Um, but it finishes with, I think, a really... A really sweet um, portrait of Tennyson. <laughs> There's Tennyson in his garden, uh, br brushing away, and his famous, famous hat. But it has the Lady of Shalott, and I thought we left ourselves at a certain point, so I thought let's have another go at some more of the Lady of Shalott. So do come over and, and sit down. Yeah, when when you left last time, I I sort of carried on, you know, and I sat down and reread the whole of the Lady of Shalott. And um, I suddenly realised it's kind of extraordinarily relevant, so I find it now again, to our time. Because um, if you think about it, we left off where we say the silent isle embowered the Lady of Shalott. And if you think about it, there's the Lady of Shalott, she's on her own. She's lonely. She's kind of locked into this tower. And there's a spell on her where she can't look directly at the world and go out and experience it but there's this big mirror set up and all she can do is look at as she calls them the shadows the reflections in the mirror 
and she longs to get away from the flat screen where she's weaving what she sees in the mirror and get out there but she knows that it's dangerous to do so and then of course she sees Lancelot and she can't help herself and she turns and I thought gosh that's so like our own experience so I ended at the end of part one should we have a little bit more just for the fun of it this is in this children's version with these lovely there's the reaper reaping early and there's the Lady of Shalott weeping because she, she's so alone. So here we are. So part two. There she weaves by night and day a magic web with colours gay. She has heard a whisper say a curse is on her if she stay to look down to Camelot. She knows not what that curse may be and so she weaveth steadily and little other care hath she, the Lady of the Shalott. And moving through a mirror clear that hangs before her all the year, shadows of the world appear. There she sees the highway near, winding down to Camelot. There the river eddy whirls, and there the surly village churls, and the red cloaks of market girls passed onward from Shalott. And of course she, she sees all kinds of people, including the knights riding by, and we're told, oh, she has no loyal knight and true, the Lady of Shalott. But in her web she still delights to weave the mirror's magic sights, for often through the silent nights a funeral with plumes and lights and music went to Camelot. Or when the moon was overhead came two young lovers lately wed. I am half sick of shadows, said the Lady of Shalott. Don't we just know how she feels? There she is, stuck and lost and lonely in isolation. Then you remember what happens in the story. A bow shot from her bower eaves, he rode between the barley sheaves. The sun came dazzling through the leaves and flamed upon the brazen greaves of bold Sir Lancelot. A red cross knight forever kneeled to a lady in his shield that sparkled on the yellow field beside remote Shalott. And we get a whole wonderful description of just how handsome and glorious Lancelot is. And then, of course, from the bank and from the river, he flashed into the crystal mirror, Tira Lira by the river sang Sir Lancelot. She left the web, she left the loom, she made three paces through the room, she saw the water lily bloom, she saw the helmet and the plume, she looked down to Camelot. Out flew the web and floated wide, the mirror cracked from side to side, the curse has come upon me, cried the Lady of Shalott. This moment that she, in the love of Lancelot, glimpsed in the mirror, she loses. And then there comes the end. I hope I've got time to read you this. This is just the last part of this poem. The description of the river and the rain and the wind and the water. It's just wonderful. In the stormy east wind straining, the pale yellow woods were waning, the broad stream in his banks complaining, heavily the low sky raining, over towered Camelot. <coughs> Down she came and found a boat beneath a willow left afloat, and round the prow she uh, around about the prow she wrote, the Lady of Shalott. And down the river's dim expanse, like some bold seer in a trance, seeing all his own mischance with a glassy countenance, she did look to Camelot. And at the closing of the day, she loosed the chain, down she lay. The broad stream bore her far away, the Lady of Shalott. Lying, robed in snowy white, that loosely flew from left to right, the leaves upon her falling light, through the noises of the night, she floated down to Camelot. <coughs> and as the boat head wound along the willowy hills and fields among, they heard her singing her last song. <coughs> the Lady of Shalott heard a carol, mournful, holy, chanted loudly, chanted lowly, till her blood was frozen slowly and her eyes were dark and holy, turned to towered Camelot. For ere she reached upon the tide the first house by the waterside, singing, in her song she died, the Lady of Shalott. Under tower and balcony, by garden wall and gallery, a gleaming shape she floated by, dead pale between the houses high, silent into Camelot. Out upon the wharfs they came, knight and burger, lord and dame, and round the prow they read her name, the Lady of Shalott. And who is this? And what is here? 
and in the lighted palace near died the sound of royal cheer, and they crossed themselves for fear all the knights of Camelot. But Lancelot mused a little space. He said, she has a lovely face. God in his mercy lend her grace, the Lady of Shalom. Our illustration has Lancelot kneeling at her tomb. And of course, Lancelot saying that last prayer for her, little knows that he himself was the cause of her demise. I think there are amazing lockdown resonances. So thank you for indulging me. I love this poem. It's fun to read it out loud. Thanks for calling round.